Greetings to you in the name of Jesus. Welcome to part three of our Revelation series in which we are going to start from verse 12 in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Again, I would like to remind you that I am reading from the King James Version. Verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampsticks or candlesticks. Now, we see John hearing a great voice like the voice of the trumpets, the noise of the trumpets behind him. And he turned to see the voice that spoke with him. Verse 11 says, who spoke? What message was spoken? Jesus spoke, right? It was Jesus who spoke from behind John. And now he turns to see who spoke. Now let me advance you to verse 17 as to what happened to John when he saw Jesus. Look at verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. You know, when John saw Jesus in his splendor, now he fell at his feet as though dead. Now that tells me something about the splendor of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. Now John, about 60 years prior to seeing the vision here in Revelation, reclined on the side of Jesus. John was somebody who walked with Jesus, talked to Jesus, who was with Jesus, so close to him, that at the Passover, he reclined on the side of Jesus. And about 60 years later, he sees Jesus, but not as the one who was when he was uh, here on earth, but in his splendor, in his current state. And John couldn't help falling at his feet, at the feet of Jesus, as though dead. Now I believe if I was there, I would have fallen dead. Because that's the immense glory of Jesus. And I'm really puzzled over some people who just take Jesus very lightly. And they say, well, I saw Jesus, he came into my room, he held my hand, and he took me on a tour of the Hades, the tour of the paradise, etc., etc. Et you know, I, I get a real shock as to how these people can survive after seeing Jesus in his splendor. I believe, if at all, anyone sees Jesus in a vision, that Jesus would reduce the splendor to be able to show himself to these people without making the people perish. Okay? Because Jesus is absolutely glorious. He is great, right? Anyway, now when John saw Jesus in Jesus' current uh, state, the way John describes Jesus symbolize, symbolizes a lot of things. And that's why he is explaining the, the raiment of Jesus, the appearance of Jesus, the head and the hair of Jesus, the, the feet of Jesus, the eyes of Jesus. There are eight things that he describes in these verses that we are going to study. And those eight things speak of something. They are, sim they are symbolic in language. And uh, let us see what the way Jesus looks symbolizes to mean to us. Okay? Right. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampsticks. Can you see it here? This is the menorah. This is the seven golden lampsticks. Okay? Now what, what does the menorah signify? What does the menorah mean? Of course, the menorah was used in the Old Testament, starting from the tabernacle that Moses erected, followed by the temple of Solomon, followed by the temple of Zerubbabel, and uh, it has a lot of uh, spiritual significance. But here in Revelation, the golden candlesticks 
represents something else. To understand that, you need to read the last line of verse 20. Verse 20, the last line says, And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. In the book of Revelation, the candlesticks, this menorah, represent the seven churches. In our foregone part of this series, I explained what the seven churches mean. But in a, in a peri peripheral, uh, simple manner. But when we step into chapter 2, I'm going to explain in detail as to what the seven churches really are. But then I said that the seven churches represent all the churches from the time the church started until the time the church is going to be raptured. So the candlestick denotes the, the churches, all the churches. Okay. Now, where does Jesus stand in relation to the menorah, the candlestick? Verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Okay, in the midst. Now, in the Jewish tradition, the one who stands in the middle is the leader. When the rabbis taught, they always sat and taught, usually from the middle. Now, if you look at a wrestling ring or a boxing ring, people stand, sit all around in that auditorium when in the middle the ring is placed where the matches take place. Like that, the leader stands in the middle in the Jewish tradition which was given by God to signify some of the important elements of uh, the divine uh, ways of action, right? So Jesus standing in the midst of the seven golden lampsticks, candlesticks, Tell me, t tells me that he is the leader of the churches. Yes, we know that, don't we? Jesus is the head of the church. But wait a minute. Is that the case with every church today? Is Jesus the leader of the church? Are the churches playing according to the tune of Jesus? Or many churches... Are many churches trying to manipulate Jesus to act as per their expectations? So, my dear friends, a real church needs to have Jesus as the head of the church. Now, when we get into chapters 2 and 3, we are going to see how Jesus was thrown out of the church because of they, they need to run the church uh, with a social gospel with uh, a way pleasing unto men and to keep the people intact rather than pleasing Jesus. And that's why Jesus had to knock on the door of the church saying, can I come in? Will you open? Will you open the door? If you open, I will come in and sup with you. Anyway, when Jesus was seen by John, John sees Jesus standing right in the middle of the seven candlesticks, meaning that he stands as the leader, as the head of all the churches. Okay? Right. Now why does John say, like unto the Son of Man? Like unto the Son of Man. For example, Jesus appeared as the Son of Man. Even in the Old Testament, if you see Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14. And then if you see uh, Daniel chapter 10 verses 5 through to 10, you would see uh, the Christophany in the Old Testament, if Jesus appears, we call it Christophany. Appear, uh, the Christophany appears in which Jesus comes and is addressed as the Son of Man. Now here, John says that Jesus looked like the Son of Man. Why didn't he say, I saw the Son of Man standing in the middle of the candlesticks? Because of his um, emotions, I'll explain. He saw Jesus. He recognized Jesus. Why? Because he was with Jesus. He was with the Son of Man. So he recognized Jesus. Nonetheless, he did not dare calling Jesus the Son of Man in a definitive sense, but he is leaving an abstract there. He's saying, like the Son of Man. Why? 
Yes, this is the son of man. But the one I'm seeing is way more glorious than the son of man who I used to walk with, whose side I reclined. So now Jesus, yes, this is Jesus. But, but, but let me be on safe grounds by saying like the son of man rather than saying the son of man. Okay, he's playing, playing uh, safely. <laughs> so he's saying Jesus is more glorious now to call him the son of man. So he adds the, the like bit and he says like unto the son of man. Are you with me? Okay. Now, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Clothed with the garment down to the foot. What's this garment? This was none other than the garment of the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now we must understand that there are two orders of priesthood. Number one, Melchizedek's order of priesthood and number two, the Aaronic or the Levitical order of priesthood. My dear friends, when we talk about priests, we the, the thing that comes to our mind is the Levitical priesthood. Moses appointed Aaron, of course God told Moses to appoint Aaron as the high priest and the two sons of Aaron as priests and ever since the tribe of Levi became the priestly tribe. The every Levite was a possible priest. And if somebody descended from the Aaronic line, lineage, then they can qualify to become the, the high priest. But there existed a form of priesthood long before the origin of the Hebrews. And we know that was Melchizedek. In Genesis chapter 14, we are introduced to a character called Melchizedek. When Abraham went and rescued Lot and uh, the three kings from, from the enemies, Melchizedek went and met Abraham and gave Abraham bread and wine. And in turn, Abraham tithed his tithe to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is called the king of Shalom and he was the high priest of God at that time, long before the Hebrews originated, long before the tribe of Levi came into existence, long before the order of Levitical priesthood was appointed. Okay, Now if you read Hebrews chapters 6, 7 and 8, you would see that the high priesthood of Jesus stems from Melchizedek not Aaron. That is why we who are Gentiles, who do not belong to the tribe of Levi, we are not Jews, but we are priests because our high priest, Jesus, is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. That is why we who are Gentiles, who do not belong to the tribe of Levi, we are not Jews, but we are priests because our high priest, Jesus, is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, as a Jewish man, the son of man, Jesus, could not have played the role of a priest because he did not come in the tribe of Levi. But he could play the role of a king because he came from the kingly tribe of Judah and especially from the lineage of David. So humanly speaking, the human Jesus could be only the king because he came in the tribe of Judah. That is why he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the son of man, the human Jesus, could not be called the priest because he did not come from the tribe of Levi. And that's why the Bible very clearly says that he is the high priest not in the order of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood, but in the order of Melchizedek, who preceded the Hebrews. Therefore, we, the Gentiles, are able to be priests. We are a royal priesthood, right? Peter says, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. How did we become a royal priesthood? 
by having Jesus, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, we the Gentiles are able to be priests under this high priest. So the raiment that Jesus is wearing, which is his, his clothes from all the way from the shoulder down to the foot, and that is not the Aaronic priestly garment, but the garment of Melchizedek. Now when I read the books about the book of Revelation, when I listen to teachings of many scholars, when I come to this point, they usually explain Jesus as the high priest, as wearing the cloth of the high priest in the tribe, according to the tribe of Levi. That's not correct. Jesus is not a high priest in the order of Aaron or the tribe of Levi, but in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Now praise God. Because of Jesus being the high priest, we are able to enter into the Holy of Holies ever since Jesus died on the cross. Remember, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place in the temple was torn into two, meaning there is no more veil to the, the Holy of Holies through Jesus, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We can now enter into the very presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, right? A girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, what is what does that mean? Now, there, there, there used to be a tradition in the old Jewish world. Now, many people have forgotten this tradition. Unfortunately, I have spoken to some Jews even some Jews, most of the Jews even have forgotten this beautiful tradition they once had. A long, long time ago, when somebody wanted to be a big shot in the village, he will have to fight an animal in the presence of people and win that animal or control that animal. And he can have an animal of his choice, but not a deer or a rabbit, not a harmless animal, some strong animal. Perhaps uh, maybe a lion, maybe a tiger, maybe a bear, maybe a bull. Usually it was a bull, right? Now, if somebody, having got all these people, witness what's happening there in a theater-like place, if this person manages to control a, a, a bull or a he-goat, right? or sometimes uh, uh, perhaps a, a tiger, a leopard, or even a lion, then that person becomes, becomes a hero. He is girded with uh, a breastplate, right? Usually made with bronze, or sometimes silver, right? To show the people that he has won over a beast. And if that person came from a royal family, then he can choose to have a golden sash instead of a bronze or a silver one because he is royalty. Now that is why Jesus is wearing a breastplate here and this is a golden one because Jesus is not only a king but he is the king of kings, right? Now he wears the golden sash around his breast is because he won the most vicious, terrible, strongest beast that is available on earth, namely Satan. The Satan is also a beast, right? Now Jesus doesn't need to control an ox, a, a, a bull, a, a, a tiger, a, a lion, because they were mere animals, anybody, any big shot could do that. But nobody could control or defeat Satan but Jesus. And Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. My dear friends, Satan is a defeated foe. If he is showing any power, if he is demonstrating any power, that is a broken power. Jesus broke the power of Satan. But if people don't accept Jesus and the power of Jesus 
that broke and nullified the power of uh, the devil completely, they will be defeated under Satan. The Satan could defeat them. But we praise God that our high priest, Jesus, has won the beast called Satan and he is wearing the golden sash around his chest. Okay? Praise God for that glorious victory. Jesus did not just win over sin, but also the devil. Now verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His head was white and his hair was white. What are the symbolical expressions to this? Head. Head denotes righteousness. His head is the chief place of a human body. And Jesus' head is white. White because he is complete in righteousness. Jesus is the Lord of righteousness. There is no blemish in him. There is no sin in him. There is no weakness in him. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Okay. So his head being white shows that he is complete in righteousness. But it's not just righteousness. It also signifies holiness. It shows holiness. And my dear friends, Jesus is holy. Now, when we talk about holiness, many people erroneously interpret holiness to be a form of cleanliness. I don't see cleanliness within holiness. God is clean, okay? Whether he's righteous, whether he's holy, whether he's immutable, whatever, he is clean. So by using the term holy, we don't need to show that God is clean. He is clean anyway. Holiness is something else. The Hebrew word for holiness, kadosh. And the uh, Greek word for holiness, hagios. Kadosh in Greek, the Hebrew. And hagios in Greek means something entirely different. I'll tell you what that is. Being separated. Being unique. Being staying away from everything. So Jesus is holy in that he is not mixed with anything or anyone. He is alone. Of course, we know the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons are holy. They are united. They are in essence and substance united. I'm not here to talk about Trinity. That's not within the scope of my uh, teaching. But what I would like to say is that, yes, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are always together. They are one. Although they are three persons, we are talking about one God, not three gods. But we, we, we talk of them as holy, set apart, staying away from anything else. Jesus is seen here as holy because him, his head is as white as snow. Being alone, lifted above everything. Standing aloft, standing up high, not mingled, not mixed with anything or anyone. That is why when, when, when the Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy, God is saying, look, I'm not amalgamated with anything. I'm not mixed with anything. I'm separated. I'm alone. So you also be separated from the world and be separated unto me. That's holiness. That's kadosh. That's hagios. Okay. So Jesus is holy. That's why in Revelation, when you see, eventually, when you, in our series we will talk about that. When the angels saw God, they were saying, wow, kadosh. Oh, he's, he, he, he's not comparable to anything or anyone. He's there. Nobody can, can, mingle with him. Nobody can mix with him. Nothing can be amalgamated with him because he is separate. He is unique. He is one of its kind. That's Hagios. That's Hadosh. That's holiness. That's what his head being white was all about. Okay? Hair. His hair was white. 
Now what does hair signify? Now when you read the Proverbs, you will see that uh, white hair talks of, shows forth maturity. Now, Jesus' hair being white does not only show his holiness, but his eternity. He is the oldest one around, right? Because he has no beginning. He has no ending. He has been there in the eternal past. So there is no commencement to our Lord. Now when you look at other gods in religions, all those gods came into existence at some point. But Jesus never had an origin. He is the oldest of all. Okay, So his hair being white shows that he is old and uh, not, not in a negative sense, you know, not in a negative sense as in old, but in a positive sense that he is, he has been there, he has been around for the past, from the past, from the eternal past, right? His hair is completely white. His eyes, the Bible says, were as a flame of fire. Now when John saw Jesus, John was able to see the eyes of Jesus. They were like flames of fire. Why? Why? There is a symbolical meaning to this, my dear friends. Jesus was really angry. You know, fire in the eyes show metaphorically that the person is really mad at something. Now I see the Jesus who John saw was not happy. He was not sad, but he was angry. He was upset over something. And uh, we, would, we, we understand why only when we go in deep, in depth to study chapters 2 and 3. So wait patiently until we get down to chapters 2 and 3. But at this moment, I want to just tell you that Jesus was upset, not about anything, but about the church. He was standing right in the middle of the uh, menorah, the candlesticks, and uh, he was very indignant over the church. Now, uh, some scholars would say that uh, here Jesus was indignant uh, due to the sins of the world. But uh, when we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus was passionate when he saw the sinful people. He was not angry over sinners. He was compassionate over sinners. Remember in uh, uh, Luke when Jesus sent uh, the, the, the people, uh, the disciples two by two. He said, look, the harvest is plenty. Laborers are few. Pray to the father of the harvest to send more laborers. So, he was actually passionate. He was uh, compassionate about uh, the sins of the world. He was not necessarily indignant over the sins of the world. But those who got saved, who were brought into the kingdom of God and who now belong to the ecclesia, the church, uh, need to show forth, demonstrate a higher level of holiness, a higher level of purity, a higher level of commitment to God and to his word. But when the church so he is away, moves away from the required purity and the holiness, then obviously the head of the church, Jesus, becomes upset over that. So here we see Jesus very enwrathed over the church. Okay. Now verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass. Now brass or bronze is to be interpreted as judgment because by looking at the Old Testament we see that bronze or brass was used in the altar in the temple and the tabernacle. Now what does what happens on the altar? The, the animal that is slaughtered is placed upon the altar and offered as a sacrifice. So the altar is a place of judgment when an animal is killed when an animal animal is offered as a sacrifice that is judgment of course the animal bore the sins of the people who offered that animal so the judgment for sin was on that altar and we know when moses erected uh, the tabernacle 
and when uh, Solomon erected the temple, the altars were covered with bronze. So bronze in the Old Testament denote judgment. So here, Jesus' feet are of bronze. And Jesus' feet therefore mean judgment. In other words, when Jesus is angry, when his eyes are like blazing fire, over the church, the judgment of Jesus to the church is given by his foot. Now, if the judgment was in his hands, the hand can spank, slap and embrace. But if the judgment is in the foot, it can merely kick but cannot embrace. Are you with me? So, during the last days, now we are talking about uh, the book of Revelation, okay. In the eschatological sense of judgment, when Jesus judges the church, if the church, our church is you and I, right? We are the church. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. When Jesus judges the church, eventually, not now, but in the end, he is going to carry the judgment on his feet, not anywhere else. Meaning, when he judges, that's it. There is no time for repentance. We right now are living in the period of grace when we have the time to repent. Now, right now, we have the time to repent. Right now, we have the time to check our lives against the scriptures and put things right. But there comes a day, the day of judgment, when there will be no time to change. There will be no time to repent. There will be no time to explain things to God. But he judges with his feet. And I believe that if we are not faithful to the end, then we saved Christians are also doomed. Okay, let's, let's read further. His voice as the sound of many waters. He heard, John heard the, the, the Lord speak from behind and that's why he turned. Now he is saying the sound of Jesus is like many, the sound of many waters, like a huge waterfall. Now we are talking about uh, John in the first century. And he, he was not aware, aware of uh, the artificial sounds that we are aware of. The heavy boosters, the heavy sounds through amplifiers and speakers. John didn't know all those. For John, the loudest was a huge waterfall. Now I didn't understand this until uh, I believe in 98, I think in 1998, when I visited the Niagara Falls, right? Some of you must have gone to the Niagara Falls. And uh, Mercy and I went to the Niagara Falls, right? And we took the boat made of the mids, mist, made of the mist. And uh, they give you the raincoats that you have to wear. And then you have to go on that boat. The boat goes all the way near, uh, the, near where the water is falling. Okay, now both of us were on the boat uh, in the front enjoying Niagara Falls and uh, at one point I looked up and I saw a flight and I remembered something. About uh, two years prior to that, I believe. No, four years prior to that. Because this was 96 or 98. But in 94, when Mercy and I flew to Canada on Air Canada, we were flying to Calgary from Manchester, England, uh, because it was Air Canada, the pilot, the Canadian pilot was very proud to show the Niagara Falls and he announced, uh, he sort of uh, brought the plane down uh, to uh, a few thousand uh, feet lower and he said, uh, he told the passengers to look uh, out the window first uh, on the through the left and then through the right. And he said, what you see down is the world's largest waterfall, which is the Niagara Falls. And it's shared by both the United States and Canada. And that's um, a great thing that we have in our country. He was very proud about that. And when I looked from up high, 
when I looked at uh, the Niagara Falls, oh, it was so gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. It was a clear day, cloudless day, wonderful. And uh, I, I just said, Lord, take, take me there one day. And uh, I had forgotten all about it. But uh, four years later, yeah, that was in 98, uh, the Lord graciously took both of us to that very place. And, and there was I on that boat called the Maid of the Mist. And uh, then I looked up and I saw a flight and then I remembered, wow, four years ago I prayed from up there for God to take me and now God has brought me here. To remind Mercy of what happened four years ago and how God has brought us here, I told Mercy, look up, look up, look at the flight. Remember, and, and I was so close to Mercy and I was yelling, I was screaming to tell her, but she couldn't hear. Why? Because the sound of the water was so loud, what I spoke was not heard by Mercy. And she was, she was saying something I couldn't hear. And I, 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 I began to scream in her ears. Even then she didn't uh, hear. That, that was when I really understood what John meant by when he said the sound of waters. Because up until that point, yes, I had been to waterfalls in Sri Lanka. I had seen the sound of waters, but I never realized this, that the sound of waters can submerge the voice of a human to zero, absolute zero, that you cannot talk to somebody else so close to you, even when you yell at their ears. Boy, and that's exactly what our John is saying here, because he's saying, when Jesus, at the judgment day, when he judges the church, when he is going to judge the church with uh, his foot, he is not just going to judge them, but he is going to tell them why he judges them. He is going to tell them how they disobeyed the scriptures. And his voice is going to be so loud that nobody could outspeak his voice. Nobody could explain to him, well, Lord, you know, this is why I did, this is why I said like that. Today, the voice of those who commit uh, errors knowingly is very loud. As a pastor, there are times when I approach my believers to tell them that uh, they are mm, incorrect in certain areas. They need to put certain things right. And when they respond, their tone of voice outspeaks my tone. Why? Because they say, well, pastor, you know, the reason why I did that was uh, da, 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 then I have to just shut up. Why? Because their arguments are only too fair. They have a point in what they say. So today, on the earth, we can explain ourselves away to other humans, to our leaders, to others, if somebody points out, hey, you are not obeying the word in this, 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 these areas, we can easily explain the things out and we can, uh, we can um, get away with it. But the day is coming when the Lord is going to tell us that we have deliberately disobeyed the word of God. And at that point, we will find ourselves unable to explain it out, to get away with it, because the sound of Jesus would be so loud, it cannot be outspoken. I believe you understand what I'm trying to say. So it is better for us to not wait for that day, but starting from now, read the Bible, correct ourselves, put things right. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now, let's go to verse 20 again to understand the meaning of the seven stars. Because in verse 20 we saw that the seven candlesticks, the menorah, represented the churches. Now in the same verse, it says in the middle, middle part of the verse, verse 20, the seven stars are the 
angels of the seven churches. Now, don't think now many people uh, go uh, too much into this and they say that uh, these are talking about angels. But angeloi, angels, don't necessarily need to mean the celestial beings. But here, within context, it talks about the pastors of the church. Churches. Pastors who are shepherds. Of course, we all are sheep. When we become Christians, we become sheep. Our good shepherd is Jesus. But in his system, he has appointed some as human shepherds, pastors, to lead the flock. They have to lead, feed, protect and guide the church. Not everybody is called in that vocation, but those who are called are very precious. Now I am one of the pastors, I am the pastor of our church. Now when I go to some other church, I am not the pastors, pastor of those people, they have their own pastor, but I am also a pastor. Now when we talk about a church, the pastor of that church is a star. Not a star like in Hollywood, but a star. And Jesus is holding the star in his right hand. Here, there are seven stars because this talks about seven churches. So each church has one star. Each church has one shepherd. You may have many leaders. You may have many elders. You may have many deacons, you may have many apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists and teachers. But you will have that one pastor, the one shepherd, who even, even, even if you have many other assistant pastors, there will be that one pastor, the one shepherd, who is accountable to God for that particular church. And these servants of God are held on the right hand of Jesus. My dear friends, we need to really understand that Jesus said, if any man serves me, my father, him will my father honor. So the pastors, the ministers are in an honorable position in God, by God. And the pastors, they are on the right hand of Jesus. That doesn't mean to say that they are infallible. No, 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 no. They are humans. So they are fallible in many ways. They err. They make mistakes. Right? Now, pastors need to be very careful because from the pastor's point of view or from the pastor's angle, we must understand if, if pastors are watching this, I'll tell you, we, you and I, pastors, must be very careful because our, we are standing on the right hand of Jesus. We need to be very careful. We need to maintain our sanctity, our holiness, our high standard that is required of us. We have to be very careful. And to the rest of the people, I would say, don't talk bad about the pastors. Don't judge the pastors. If they, are, they commit a mistake, bring it to the Lord and leave it at that. Let the Lord take care of it. Today, we see a lot of boldness in churches. In the wrong way. Of course, we are not timid people because uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We are not supposed to be timid uh, people who are afraid, but our daringness, our boldness shouldn't be employed against our pastor, the men of God. If they err, if they commit a mistake, if we can talk to them, fine, in a very polite manner because they are our shepherd, right? But we lay it at the feet of the Lord and then leave it at that. Don't try to complain against them. Don't talk to others about the mistakes of pastors. Don't judge them because they are on the right hand of Jesus. Now that doesn't allow the pastor to dance a jig, to do anything he wants. We as pastors must be hyper careful in our holy walk with the Lord because we are standing on the palm of the right hand of Jesus. Okay? 
and uh, it says out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword earlier on we saw that the voice of Jesus was so loud like the rushing gushing waters and what came out of his mouth is none other than the word of God the word of God is a double-edged sword okay we know that and Jesus spoke only that which is expressed to us in the word of God when Jesus judges not only the world but here the church now here we see him as the judge of the church because he's standing right in the middle of the seven candlesticks as the righteous judge of the church he's going to judge the church according to the word of God he is not going to judge from anything outside the Bible so it is easy for us to start examining our lives and to put things right in light of the scriptures because this is the premise on which the judge Jesus stands to judge his body the church are you with me he is going to talk only the word of God okay not anything else and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength the sun you cannot look at the sun can you well of course through some infrared uh, glass you can but can you look at the sun with your naked eyes no why it's so bright the ultraviolet is so glowy you cannot and when John saw Jesus of course he describes what he saw but he couldn't look at Jesus because he was so bright he was so luminous he was so uh, powerful glorious his face Jesus's face shone like the Sun shining in its complete brightness that's our Jesus that's why nobody can uh, draw his picture nobody can make an idol after Jesus the real Jesus not the one who uh, came and roamed about uh, the earth as a human but now the glorified Christ is greater than a son in his glory so my dear friends today we saw how glorious is Jesus today as the judge of the church so John saw Jesus in Revelation 1 as not the judge of the entire universe but as the judge over the church alone and that's why verse 17 says and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not I am the first and the last wow what a privilege did John receive to have Jesus touch him in his glory and say fear not I am the first and the last I am he that liveth and was dead I was dead yeah and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death Jesus has all rights over hell and death he decides who is going to end up in hell and who is going to end up in the second death and he goes on to talk to John saying in verse 19 write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter okay what the book of Revelation uh, contains of course we, we discussed it in our previous uh, segment of this series but uh, things that John had seen in the past so there are things in the book of Revelation pertaining to the past of John what John saw John saw how uh, Jerusalem fell to the Romans in AD 70 and uh, John saw the persecution of Christians under the Roman Empire and John saw the turmoil that happened within the Roman Empire there are things that we are going to discuss in the book of Revelation that John saw in his life okay so Jesus says there are things that you are going to see and also by by way of visions God gave John visions and Jesus is now saying you will write what you have seen not only in your life 
there are things that you have saw in your life that I want you to write but also from the visions that I give you you need to write some of those things and the things which are the present the current relating to AD 100 and I'm going to explain that in chapters 2 and 3 when we talk about the seven churches in Asia Asia Minor so John was not not only going to write certain things from the past but also from the present to him okay and then uh, the things which shall be hereafter things that are going to happen in the future so my dear friends now if, if, if John is standing here he is supposed to write certain things from see his past that is all and the things during the days of John okay and the things that were going to come so the book of Revelation contains uh, the past not, not, not too much into the past but a little bit of the past then of the present but a lot about the future as I said in our very first part of this series that the book of Revelation talks about from the start of the church to the rapture within the first three chapters and from chapter 4 all the way to chapter, chapter 22 the things that happen in heaven and on earth from after the rapture of the church now that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 19 and verse 20 of course we saw the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches that we have already seen so my dear friends within three parts of this series we have covered chapter 1 okay in our first series we saw verses 1 2 and 3 in our second part of the series we saw from verse 4 all the way to verse 11 and today in our third part we saw from verse 12 to 20 and with that we have completed chapter 1 of Revelation and in our fourth part that's the next one we are going to start to look at the churches in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. So my dear friends we know that Jesus the righteous judge of the church is waiting to judge the church in the future but let's examine our lives against the word of God and uh, uh, live according to the word of God lest we are judged with the feet of Jesus. May God bless you. See you next time with chapter 2 of Revelation. Thank you.